Uh, it's just a, a pleasure to be with you, really, and to participate in your devotion to God and your love for God, and to have that in common with you. That's very, very beautiful, and it's a, you know, it's just delightful to be with you in that sense. And um, it's been delightful for me to, as well to get to know um, Dr. Kahn Sai. I regard that as a great privilege. And, uh, I like. I feel it's very important for me because I, I, I do advocate very much interreligious cooperation. But I think to build real uh, friendships, and personal understanding between people of different faiths and leadership from different faiths is very, very important for, for a better world. So I, I feel uh, I'm doing the Lord, I'm doing God's work by having a, a friendship beyond religious difference, and that's uh, very, very significant. And also, I'm very touched and impressed uh, by Dr. Said because I sense his very great sincerity in what he says. Although, obviously, a very educated person is very um, simple, in a sense, in his faith. And I think that's tremendously important, that we don't become so sophisticated, that we find ways not to apply truths to my own life, because we work a way out not to have to do it but rather to very um, straightforwardly and simply apply it. That's very touching and very important. And I think uh, that's a very important uh, um, qualification for a, a teacher and a preacher and someone who's going to convey to others. So uh, I really appreciate that. Um, as regards who I work for, um, I do have a role uh, with the Universal Peace Federation, which is this international non-governmental organization that has, you know, status with Echo Soccer at the UN and all these sorts of things. And of course, that's very precious and important part of the work I do. I'm also a religious follower of the founder of that federation, but also someone who's a, you know, primarily a religious teacher, and that's uh, uh, Reverend Samuel Mann, who's the founder of my f the faith I belong to. And of course that lies at the root of all the other works. So the NGO of course is not a faith, it's, it's, it's an NGO. And it includes deliberately and specifically and you know, purposefully people from all different nations and races and backgrounds and different religions. But I come to it uh, out of faith, uh, my, my devotion to it, and I've not far off 40 years now devoting to working for projects that uh, Father Moon began because uh, I regard them as very, very important to work in that way for a better world. So it's my, you know, been my privilege and delight to do that since my student days, really. I still feel very young, except when I look in the mirror, and I have to remember that I'm not, but in spirit, <laughs> I feel very young because life's very important, uh, you know, very exciting. I see lots of hope and optimism for, for a better world. If I was to say something very shortly about uh, uh, about the UPF's work, <clears throat> probably I should talk about the, the sort of fundamental principles that underlie its work. And uh, they are rooted in in faith, really, but uh, they're rooted in faith in a way that hopefully is quite universal in its application. Of course. It's inevitable when you talk about matters of religion and you come from a particular background that you tend to phrase it in terms that you're familiar with. Um, that can lead, of course, to misunderstanding and offence. But we're trying to be as universal as we can. So basically, uh, our first tenet would be that uh, all human beings have equal value uh, because we were all God's beloved creation in which God invested his whole uh, love and being. And we're all so precious to God, regardless of what race we may be, or what age we may be, or what sex we may be, or you know what faith we may be. All people are beloved of God, and that makes us one family. So that's a very, very important principle for the work that we're undertaking. Of course, as an international NGO, we embrace people who don't have a particular faith as well, or may not have a you know monotheistic faith, or however you want to put it. But we try and express it in a way that you know, talks about higher values or conscience or these sorts of matters as well. But uh, one, one humanity, one family, a 
of humanity under, under God. This is one of our most significant principles. And we, we say that that's something that uh, people all over the world would hold in common, even if they put it in a different name or a different way of understanding or, uh, as I said, higher values, that somehow we should all come under that, that common understanding, which are our best elements within our God-given nature, you know, which is up to, and, and that's the reason for our religious search and sense. The second main principle, which we say is the main tenet of all the great faiths and traditions, is that everybody should really consider how they can live for the sake of other people, and not for themselves. So that's, uh, you know, it, it's put in many different ways in different faiths. Don't do to another what you wouldn't have done to yourself, or do to others as you would be treated, or... There's many different ways of expressing it, and some call the, the golden rule, but fundamentally, that we're not put into this world to, put, to live for ourselves, but we're deliberately placed in a world where you can't live without others, and everything you're given is, is to be given to others, so very much in accordance with the words that were shared today. So that's, um, that's the most fundamental ethical principle, if you like, the other thing which we emphasize a lot in a world which may be apart from the great religious tradition is in, in, in particular the richer world and what we might call the more educated world, but not in a deeper sense. People are struggling more and more and more to keep commitment in marriage and in family and finding that those sorts of things are in decline. Families are getting fragmented and people find it very difficult to maintain a commitment to their husband or their wife to their children at a time. There's a lot of fragmentation. So we say that's a really important thing to address because in the end, in the, end the family is the school of love and therefore the school of peace. So particularly we regard as extremely sacred and tremendously influential how men and women come together in love with one another and that they do so in a way that's really pleasing to God. So the love of God can pass through <coughs> their meeting as man and woman into the next generation and be the source of life, uh, really springing very directly from the love of God. So it's a very important tenant of our work for world peace. We believe lifting up the family, lifting up fidelity in marriage, lifting up uh, you know, the preciousness of parental commitment to children. This will be more significant than any international treaties. And that it's something which lies at the heart and core of all the great faith traditions as well. It should not be lost. The other aspect really is that uh, uh, to, to recognize that humanity uh, has, of course, a material, physical aspect, but that primarily that we're spiritual beings. And therefore, if, if we want to understand ourselves and what makes for a good life, we have to pay very close attention to, to spiritual values and the human spirit. And we have to recognize these huge resources, in a sense, as, as, as I was expressing, in faith, uh, which you could not find just in, just in reason or just in technology. And there are resources, especially when it comes to issues, uh, as Bash mentioned, regarding um, forgiveness and the ability of love to go over difference and all these sorts of matters which are to do with the strength of faith. And without drawing on that aspect, and recognizing its significance, we'll not be able to make peace. So we can't make peace just by politics, just by economics, just by you know social mechanisms, although they're very important. But in the end, it, it, it's a matter of that sort of uh, uh, love of God, which translates itself into love of others, even of the enemy. That's uh, enormously important. And, and also that in this day and age, uh, we, cannot, we cannot expect to... Ex to possess peace if it's only within my family, only within my nation, only within my race, only within my religion. Uh, we have to expand beyond. Our goodwill has to go beyond our, our own grouping. And we have to find ways to reach out to others uh, beyond difference and uh, practice our goodness, not just within our own communities. Uh, this is, so the, those are probably the five main sorts of principles that the, the UPF advocates. In doing so, it tries to do so in a way that's embracing to all, not putting people off. In terms of my personal convictions, uh, as I say, they underlie my commitment to that sort of work. It's because I became a religious follower of, of Reverend Moon uh, in my about 20 years old. 
just a couple of years ago. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but that's been a big inspiration to me, and uh, I've discovered uh, through meeting people of other faiths how much I hold in common with them, and to look for what's in common. And I think we have a hugely important task as people of deep religious commitment to work together, and not to, as you were talking about, not to be seeking to criticize one another, but rather discovering those essences, and which maybe is what you're saying Islam is referring to, the, the fundamental truths that spring from God himself that underlie all the writings and searches and revelations that came to the great religious founders. In our places of worship, uh, we do acknowledge uh, all the world's great traditions in our central sort of place of worship in, in Korea, uh, in the last few years, we've actually created a prayer room now with what uh, Father Man talks about, the four great saints. He talks about Jesus, Muhammad, Confucius, and Buddha as the four great saints of human history who devoted themselves to uh, love of God and teaching of God. And we honor them. Of course, we don't have a picture of Muhammad. We do a Buddha. We do a Jesus. But of course, we cannot have a picture of Muhammad because that wouldn't be proper. So we have a a script, a beautiful script. And similarly, uh, uh, we have some, uh, just just in the last few months, they erected uh, outside uh, our main headquarters there in, in Korea, which is where Father Moon comes from. We erected also some statues as well. But again, I know that's tricky when it comes to religion. I know you don't deal with images in that way, but very respectfully, when it comes to Islam, of course, we, we're very thoughtful of that. But for us, it's somehow just expressing that we acknowledge God's been at work all down the years. As you said, the providence of God isn't restricted to a particular time or a particular nation or a particular race. It's been at work everywhere. So that's more talking about my own convictions rather than uh, the work that work at EPF. But uh, it's been very good to, to, to be at various conferences together with, with yourselves. Uh, we just had a wonderful one in Malta which uh, clashed with Eid. We were very, not very into religious in our date planning. <laughs> I think partly because we decided the date before Ramadan had come and gone and maybe the date for, for, for Eid wasn't so clear. But it's, it depends, of course, on when, you, when your Ramadan period finishes. Um, so um, <clears throat> we got it wrong and it happened to fall on that very early weekend. <clears throat> but nonetheless, we had six former heads of state and government there in Malta and we had the whole conference was about a, a new vision of cooperation between the European continent and the African continent. And we had the former Prime Minister of Egypt, former Prime Minister of Togo, and former Prime Minister of Zambia, and three former heads of state from the UK as well. And a lot of high-level uh, people really sharing deeply about how can we make a new beginning uh, between the African continent and the European continent. And some hope that Malta can play a role. And we, made the beginnings of an agreement between the Maltese Parliament and UPF to try and invest in Malta playing an educational role, a resource role on behalf of Europe towards Africa. So it was, it felt, it felt very meaningful. We have another um, conference coming up in the 9th and 10th of December in London in the Parliament on the 9th. It's really about uh, human rights. It, the title is Human Rights and Where Have We Come To Since the Declaration of of you know, human rights, uh, how far have we progressed? And we've got various sessions on human rights in Europe, human rights on a global scale, human rights regarding women and children, and human rights from a youth perspective. So we've got a lot of very, very interesting speakers, a lot of them from UK, but because UK is such a diverse place, we've got people like uh, Lord Bikuri Palik, who's an expert in multiculturalism. We've got people like uh, Lord Ahmed, who's at the university. Muslim Lord, uh, as well as you know other people of you know, more obvious uh, British background. We have another lady who's very well known. That's Baroness Scotland. I don't know if you know Baroness. She was the Attorney General under the last yeah. uh, here in Britain, and uh, she's of course from a very mixed background, although most obviously black. But actually, she's from a very mixed background. She's also coming and speaking. And we have very good speakers from from around Europe as well, from Austria, Norway, and France, and many other countries. So uh, I'll. You'll get the invitations as ever. Yes. <laughs> and probably uh, uh, they'll be like, um, put aside. It's always on my mailing list. But you'd be most welcome to come along. And one thing we're hoping to do is to have a session 
specifically on religious freedom issues. And we just, uh, we're just readjusting our schedule because we ended up with so many speakers, we couldn't fit them all in. So we've decided to do parallel sessions in two different rooms in the, in the House of Lords and the House of Commons. So now we're able, because of that, to have um, six sessions instead of four. So we're planning one that will exclusively look at religious freedom issues. And one aspect we're intending to look at is the wider Amadeus community's issues, because of course they're huge issues. And we hope even to, to invite Lord Oakley to, to make it along for that, uh, along, with, along with others. Uh, so anyhow, as I said, it's, uh, I, I feel very... Uh, it was a tough decision to come here today because there's a lot to do, mm -hmm. but I felt I can't, uh, I can't not meet up uh, with, with Karim before he goes because we wanted to do that. And as he said, we couldn't make it family to family, which I hope we will do uh, in a future occasion. But uh, I felt I couldn't uh, not come today, and I'm, I'm delighted that I could and I could meet all of you. God bless you. Thank you.